Well, I hope I can explain to you briefly uh, in 10 minutes, because I am not seeking, so it's only 10 minutes, that uh, what we are doing uh, in this sense. Well, first of all, let me show you this, uh, this graphic. It was made by an English ecologist, James Lovelock. He, he, he discovered the theory of Gaia, Gaia the planet, many years ago. And Gaia has done always the best to, to keep life in the planet until now. Now Gaia is sort of saying, well, I'm giving up, it's too much. So this was the planet 100,000 years ago during the last glaciation, okay? Notice all the ice in the north, or of course, in the Antarctic. That's today, more or less. So a lot of acid, uh, ice has melt and so forth. What would happen if temperatures continue to grow like five degrees this century? Okay, we'll end up by this. Antarctic doesn't change much, but the Arctic, we know, is melting very fast. And uh, southern Europe, Spain, southern Italy, will become like steps. So it will be impossible to grow the vines. <clears throat> well, we live from the earth, and we, the vineyards are very sensitive to heat. You know, in 20, 30 years' time, if temperatures go up 20, uh, 2, 3 degrees, well, I'm sure they will continue to grow carrots or salads, you know, vegetables, if there is water. So it should be possible. But for the vines, it will be very difficult. And you will see a drastic change in the map of the appellations of origin in Europe, the wine regions of Europe. Where are we going to place Burgundy? Where are we going to place Rioja? That's uh, really a, a big challenge. Then, in 2007, I saw this movie from Al Gore, An Inconvenient Truth, and I was shocked. I was shocked and I thought, well, we have to do something. First of all, I decided to read a lot about you know, climate change, and especially, I love to read about paleoclimatology, the history of our climate. 4,500 millions of years, this planet. So, you know, it really makes you feel like you are only a very small accident in the history of this planet. And, um, well, all these changes that took part, it's really fantastic to, to learn about this. Well, shortly after uh, I met, well, we had a board meeting in the family. We are not a large company, as, as John said. We are a you know, medium-sized company. Our sales are 200 million euros. That's okay. But, you know, we decided to invest we decided to invest 10 million euros in research and in renewable energies. And so, so we did. That's a lot for a family, but I think we've done the right thing. So, for example, we built the new cellars with a, a criteria of saving energy. I don't think it's the time to build any more cathedrals, you know, like we've done in Spain so often. Uh, Frank Gehry, um, uh, Calatrava, all these famous architects. No, it's time to go underneath build the cellars underneath so that we have more uh, better isolation. And then, of course, we can have uh, photovoltaic panels. They are producing good part of our electricity. And notice one thing here. The garden on top. We don't have flowers. We don't have grass. We have sand. Because the sun has albedo effect. And it reflects in solar light. You know, infrared, X-rayon. About 60-70%, they go up again. And they don't warm the planet. I know it's a very short thing, it's a very small thing, but it's you know, showing the will to, um, to change the, the, the image of the cellar. Well, in Rioja, we also built a cellar three years ago, and uh, you know, we built a normal cellar, but then it, it's got a second skin of uh, projected concrete, so it looks like a stone. And then it makes a perfect isolation, half a meter isolation. On top, we, can, uh, we, we, we have uh, the recollection of all the rainwater, we have also photovoltaic panels. And this, you know, kind of cellar, I think, we have to aim for in the future. There's only one problem with this cellar, is that it's really confused in the landscape. You know, you hardly notice it. It looks like a mountain. And people, when they go to visit, they come back to the village after half an hour and said, well, we didn't found the, the Torres Cellar in Rioja. <laughs> but uh, that's consequences. Okay, we help reforesting, that's important, in Catalonia and in Canary Islands. I'll pass quickly just to show you what we are doing as time goes on. We are adapting our vineyards in order to delay maturation, you know, as much as we can, uh, arriving to the days of September when the nights are cooler. That's what we want in these uh, little warmer days. We are storing water in the mountain reservoirs, 
We are preparing for drip irrigation because uh, in the future, what is going to be a must to the vineyards if we want to make quality. We are producing lighter bottles. We went from uh, 550 grams down to 380 grams, uh, so that's possible, and that's saving a lot of energy. When you estimate in a winery um, the carbon footprint, okay, more than half is due to the glass. So the glass is really a, a very expensive product to work with in this sense. We are looking for new scenarios. So because in Catalonia we are close to the Pyrenees, 200 kilometers, we have moved vineyards already very close to the Pyrenees uh, at an altitude of about 1,000 meters, cooler climate. And we produce there today our best Chardonnays, best uh, Pinot Noirs, for example. So that's a possibility we can have. Of course, we are isolating, looking for more uh, energetic efficiency. We have uh, these uh, photovoltaic panels. They produce already 11% of the electricity that we use in the winery. And in June, I want to have a biomass boiler. We've been looking for that many years. Now it's finally ready to go. We will use all these pomas, uh, all the skins, seeds, and uh, stems after the harvest. That's about uh, 6,000 tons a year. And they will, be, they will go into the boiler and they will save 1 million kilowatts. That's close to a 10% of total electricity. Amazing, isn't it? But it can be done. It can be done. It's, it's going to be a, a big change. OK, we buy hybrid cars. I drive myself a hybrid car. And I tried a month ago an electric car, an Nissan Leaf. Fantastic. I love it. There's only one problem. You can drive 150 kilometers, so make sure eh, you can plug somehow. Eh? <laughs> Otherwise, you're gone. You don't get home. OK, experimenting with uh, seaweeds, algae beds, in order to capture carbon dioxide after fermentation. This work has been going on for three years. Still difficult. We are not there yet, but we keep trying. We produce charcoal out of the wooden trunks. Imagine a vineyard can live for 40 years. Okay. And after you dig this out, that's what you get. You get the boots. The boots is the carbon that the vine, through photosynthesis, has managed to keep in the plant. And normally, what happens in the vineyards? They burn this up. You've seen that, I'm sure, when you go to wine areas. That's a disaster. All this carbon goes up again as carbon dioxide. So here, we can save at least 50% of this with this pyrolysis method, making charcoal. And the charcoal, the charcoal is stable for a thousand years. Okay? You can live in the vineyard. It's not going to go up to the atmosphere. Or the farmer can take it home for uh, well, his own uh, heating. We are participating in a wind park next year. We are helping to, um, to prevent the forest in Panades. And look at this. This graphic is fantastic. We got big fires in the 90s. But then, thanks to the patrol and, of course, you know, modernization of the Catalonia um, w w uh, Department for the fires, the, the fires are almost non-existent now, and we have a lot of forest there. OK, we take care of the forest. There is about 1,800 hectares of forest between Spain and Chile and 2,000 hectares of vineyards. All these forests and vineyards, they make photosynthesis, so to some extent, they help, um, they help the, the planet somehow. We are storing rainwater because water is going to be more and more scarce. We are recycling the water more and more. And we have an objective in the winery. That is, by 2020, we have to reduce by 30% our total output of carbon dioxide. And it's fantastic. You know, we spoke to the part, every department in the company, and everybody is coming up with ideas. We could isolate that. We could improve that circuit. And every year, we can have a reduction, like last year, 5.9% of carbon dioxide less. Then, OK, that's very nice. That's what we do in the company. And I can explain to my friends, maybe the press sometimes. But how far does it go? Very little. Then the idea came last year, OK, why don't we try to gather all the Spanish wineries and do the same thing? Then I met with uh, my friends of Fresh and Codorniu. I'm sure you know the Cabas. And uh, they agree. And then we went to Madrid, to the Spanish Federation of Wine Producers. And the Spanish Federation, we spoke to them, you know, to the board for a couple of hours, and they agreed. And then we had this group made, Wineries for Climate Protection. And in Barcelona, last June, we had our first symposium. And the special envy of uh, the Secretary of the United Nations, 
uh, Mr. Ricardo Lagos, his envy for climate change, he came to Barcelona and he was signing what we call Barcelona Manifiesto. Ten points that the wineries are engaging to respect carbon reduction, uh, water, uh, use of the water, and so forth. That was June last year. How far have we gone? Okay, last week we got already 140 wineries that sign up. Not too bad, you know? And we expect 200 by the end of this month when in Alimentaria in Barcelona, in this big food fair, this will be announced. Well, so that's, you know, we're getting somehow, uh, making some way, and this, of course, is going to be certified and it's going to be audited by Pricewaterhouse and Cooper. It's going to be very serious. But uh, I still believe we need to change. We need to change because look at the increase of the temperatures uh, between two and five degrees this century. It's too much. The pollution in the large cities, not in London, by the way, you have a very, a very clean air in London. I'm going every morning to Hyde Park for a run, mm, and it's good. <laughs> but uh, it's not, not like that everywhere. So we have, um, I, I recommend you this book by Stefan Faris, Forecast on Climate Change. He deals on the consequences that you don't expect, that migrations we are going to have, diseases coming from the south, and um, all this um, melting of the glaciers like in, in Himalaya. It's going to be a disaster, you know, for the countries around. So, Indian even Iyik says, well, we, the industrial society, we believe we can, in the midst of uh, infinite growth, we think we can continue to grow. Well, it's not that sure. We, um, the threats of our future, this is according to Lester Brown, another writer, threats of our future are not, are not armed aggression. The threats are poverty, water scarcity, rising food prices, uh, rising temperatures. These are the real threats, but armament and oil industry, they want to maintain the status quo, and it's normal, I mean, it's, it's business. That's a, a big problem. And then Lester Brown says also, how can we assume that, that the, growth, the growth of this economic system that has devastated the forest, polluted the waters, uh, creating all these problems with food and everything, how could we think this can be projected into the future, into the new generations? Impossible. <clears throat> okay, we have a thousand million of people hungry in the world. That's something we should be. But still we consume 80 million barrels of oil per day. So I really oil, our world is oil drug addict, kind of. Uh, and the subsidies from the government, world governments, they are uh, kind of 500 million, billion dollars for the oil, only 46 million dollars for the renewable energies. 10 times more, why? We should be adapting more and more renewable energies. Climate change is anthropogenic, it's us, it's not mother nature. Of course, negationists are going to tell you, yes, this happened before uh, in the Paleozoic or whatever. It's true, it happened along the history of the planet. But the last case, for example, 55 million of years ago, we had an increase in the temperatures. They went up by six degrees, like it's maybe going to happen in 100 years. But it took 20,000 years. What a difference. We're gonna make almost the same in 300 years. So, something. Are we really not to change our lifestyle at all? That's a big question, you know, that we, our generation, have to ask. Okay, it's, um, you know, my hope that the Spanish wineries will come along with this project and uh, maybe we'll be followed by France the year after. Maybe other countries, maybe other industries, you know, we like to, um, to uh, also to copy this, this idea. And if it works, I would like to, you know, to, well, to dream that in the future, wine is gonna be seen not only a fantastic drink that gives you pleasure and health, but also as an industry that is taking care of the environment. Thank you very much.